Good morning, everyone, and a warm welcome to today's session, Flying Free, A Legacy of Strength, where we will be talking to two outstanding women who lead by example. And I'm Rachna Singh, and I'm really, really pleased to welcome Pardas Madhavi, a writer and an academician whose book, Book of Queens, is a fabulous and true account of women warriors astride their Caspian horses, fighting warlords, fighting the Taliban, and of course, fighting the deeply entrenched patriarchal framework in not only Iran, but also Afghanistan and Turkey. So wonderful to have you with us, Padis. Thank you. It is also my pleasure to have on the panel Ruchira Gupta, whose book, I Kick and I Fly, literally flies in the face of human trafficking and fights for the rights of sex workers in the red light area of Forbes Gunj. So with that context in place, ladies and gentlemen, I promise you this is going to be a very interesting session with a lot of adrenaline pumping, a lot of talk about strong women and how they fly. So without further ado, let me just dive into the conversation. And my first question is for both of you, Padis and Ruchira. Now every story and every book has a backstory too. And I'm sure your novels have a backstory too. So uh, talk to us a little about the genesis of your books. Um, Ruchira, uh, your book, I Kick and I Fly, is an amazing, nail-biting, inspiring account of this 14-year-old Hira, you know, from a marginalized nomadic tribe living in the red light area of Obis Ganj, and how she escapes that vicious, you know, intergenerational cycle of prostitution. So what inspired you to pen your book? Tell us a little about that. I used to be a journalist, and I was uh, hiking the hills of Nepal when I came across rows, rows of villages with missing girls. And I asked the men who were sitting around drinking tea, playing cards, where the girls were. And the question changed my life because they told me in Mumbai, I followed the trail and found little girls locked up in small rooms for years. And as a woman, as a journalist, as a citizen of India and the world, I was first upset, sad, and then angry, and finally determined to do something about it. So I ended up making a documentary, and I won an Emmy for Outstanding Investigative Journalism for the documentary, The Selling of Innocence. Yes, yes. It's on my website, ruchiragupta.com. And then, you know, the women who had broken their silence in the documentary said that you have to help us now that you won the Emmy and you've become so famous and all of that. And uh, I started an NGO with them uh, called Apne Aap, which means self-action in Hindi. And... Um, what we did do was uh, base the entire business plan on the dreams of the women. The four dreams were school for their children, a room of their own, a job in an office, and punishment of their perpetrators. And we started community classrooms in the red light districts. And we used to start educating the kids. But the traffickers uh, were violent, and they would sometimes kidnap our girls. We began a hostel. They would jump over walls. Uh, they would beat up the children for coming to our classrooms, and especially in Forbisganj, Bihar, where one of my community centers is. And so I thought that I have to find a way that these girls can at least kick a few teeth in if these traffickers come after them. So I asked a couple, a man and a woman, who used to teach karate to some kids in this small agricultural town near the rice fields, that would you come to our center in the red light area, to our hostel, to teach the girls karate and kung fu? And he agreed. And then, very quickly, these girls who were so ashamed of themselves, hungry, homeless, bullied in school, uh, you know, would drop out because they were first generation learners, uh, suddenly began to do well in karate. And one girl actually won a gold medal. And I knew what she had been through, so I began to plot the novel in that moment. 
thinking that this is huge, you know, because everything began to change for her when she won the gold medal in karate. She began to like herself. Her community began to respect her. Her father, who wanted to sell her, suddenly thought his worth, uh, daughter was worth something. The school bully stopped bullying her. The teachers began to respect her. And she told me that learning self-defense, I learned I have a self-worth defending. So I thought this is a story of <laughs> truth and hope that I must share with the world. And that was the pivot that also was the basis of the success of Apne Aap. You know, we have educated more than 3,000 girls through school and college. One's even a police officer now. And, uh, you know, just the discovery of the body through karate and kung fu was a pivotal moment. So that's the story of I Kick and I Fly. And my character is called Hira. She is a diamond in the dust who shines with polish. Yeah, amazing. It's an amazing journey that you've mapped out in your book. So Padis, your book, like I said, it's about these stunning warrior horsewomen, you know, astride Caspian horses. And this is also a true story because I believe it is a story about your own grandmother, Mariam, you know? So it's like a tribute to your grandmother and the way she challenged the patriarchy in Iran at that point in time. And um, I'll be very honest, I finished your book in one sitting. Normally, I am very slow with reading memoirs and, uh, you know, autobiographies or biographies, but I finished it in one sitting. And for many days after I finished your book, the image that stayed with me is the image, yes, on right on the cover of your book, is the image of a woman astride on a horse, bareback, with her arms free to shoot and aim, and her headscarf flying in the breeze like a banner of defiance, you know? So uh, tell us what was your creative trigger here. Well, thank you so much. And it's an absolute honor to be here in conversation with you both and an absolute honor, pleasure, and lifelong dream, actually, to be here at the Jaipur Literature Festival. I've dreamed of coming here since it started, so it's a, it's a big moment for me. Um, so this book, uh, as you mentioned, is, is really, in a way, a love letter to my grandmother. Um, and uh, the backstory for this book was, um, I started thinking about uh, this question of hope and strength during a pretty challenging period um, for, for women and women's rights. So we had just had the election of, of uh, a president, uh, Donald Trump, who had enacted a Muslim ban. And my daughter came home one day from school in, in Los Angeles, and she said, a, a boy at school told her that now that Trump was president, that she was going to have to go back home. And she's like, well, where, where is home? Because she knew that I could not return to Iran. And she said, well, if we can't go to Iran and we can't stay here, wh where can we be? And it inspired me to start looking within my own family for stories of hope. And so I actually went into my parents' storage unit and opened up a box um, that had all my notes from my field work in Iran. I had done field work for seven years on Iran's sexual revolution. That was the subject of my first book, Passionate Uprisings. And during the time that I did my field work, I had also been riding horses. And I would meet groups of feminist activists on horseback. And so I went into my parents' storage unit, and I actually opened up that box that had all the notes from, from the, you know, my time on horseback because I had just started riding again. I, I really actually learned to ride in Iran, and I had just started riding again back in the United States. And I opened up the storage uh, box, and there was a, a journal that had been gifted to me by an American horsewoman named Louise Firuz. Who had, who had moved to Iran in the 1960s after falling in love with a Qajar prince named Narsi Firuz and began a horse riding academy. And as I opened up the journal, a letter from Louise fell out that I had never seen before. She had gifted me this journal. And a letter fell out. And the letter said, Dear Pardis, please follow the story of the Caspian horses because it is your story. And at this point, she had already passed away. And I kicked myself for never having asked Louise a bit more about how and why she became inspired to ride Caspian horses. It was about this time that I was looking through photographs and letters from Louise 
that my father came into the room and he said, oh, you're looking at Caspian horses and Achateki horses. And I said, yes, how do you know? Because my father would never go near a horse all through my childhood. And he said, well, of course, because all my sisters were riding these same horses, which led me then down a path of talking to all my aunties who were in their 90s uh, on FaceTime. And I started showing them pictures of Louise, and they started to tell me the story that I did not know about my own grandmother. I had only met her once as a child. But she told me the story of my grandmother who had been breeding Caspian horses out of extinction. Caspian horses are the oldest living breed of horses on the planet. But she would use these horses to smuggle women out of domestic violence situations in Iran on horseback from Iran into Afghanistan and Iraq. And she would smuggle these women by getting the horses drunk on homemade whiskey. And then these women who were then smuggled into, into the caves, into Afghanistan, helped to form an all-female army that began fighting warlords on horseback. And this is the story. This is the story of my own family, who also were horsewomen warriors, who ended up training the horses and helping American Green Berets defeat the Taliban in the early years of the war on terror. It was these same women. And the more I learned about these stories, the more I could feel my hope coming back to me. I wrote the book at a time of hopelessness in, in America. And I stud sar suddenly started to feel the strength of my grandmother and the thousands and thousands of, of horse women warriors of Persia that came before me. And I began to think, you know, we talk so much about intergenerational trauma. That's like the, the phrase of the day in the States, intergenerational trauma. And I suddenly thought to myself, why not talk about intergenerational strength? And that's what inspired me to write the book. Amazing, intergenerational strength. That should be the tagline for all women everywhere in the globe, yes. Um, so Ruchira, my next question is for you. You've been working for more than two decades trying to empower vulnerable women, three decades, I stand corrected, three decades trying to empower vulnerable women and children in Forbes Ganj, and trying to create a world which you call uh, where no human being can be bought or sold, which is, that's your mantra, you know. And in fact, due to your unrelenting efforts, you talk about them in your letter by an author, and you have told us that uh, the brothels in Forbes Ganj have whittled down from 72 to 2. And the UN has also rolled out Trafficking Victims Protection Act US on account of you. US okay, US government. And your Emmy-winning film, of course, has built a lot of awareness about victims of prostitution. And of course, you're doing some splendid work in Apne Aap, you know, the NGO you have just mentioned. So tell us what made you really gravitate towards this cause, this particular cause of empowering women. You know, every, we all are like Russian dolls. And within ourselves, we have smaller dolls. And every story probably has a backstory. So I don't know what that moment was when I became this fiery feminist. But I feel I was all along. When I was growing up at home, you know, our home was a Gandhian socialist household. So everyone was talking about nation building. My father had been to jail as a 15-year-old, still wears homespun till this day, you know, and all of that. So it was all about how do we make the nation better? What is modernity? How is everyone equal? There was a lot of conversation about caste and class in my house. So I used to think, where do I fit in even as a young girl? And I would think, you know, that everyone talks about equality, but, you know, somehow even at home, the men and women are unequal. I would, my mother would tell me that you have to learn how to cook. And I would say, why don't you teach my older brother first? And because it was a socialist household, nobody forced me to learn how to cook, you know. As soon as I had an answer, then that would be fine. And so I never learned cooking. In school, I got expelled from the home science classes because in defiance, I poured kerosene into a pan and almost burned the school down. So I must have been a feminist. I did want to make a difference inspired by the conversations at home. I was surrounded by books and ideas. 
and uh, you know the conversation at home was not what are you going to be but what are you going to do for others and uh, so uh, that was the ethic in those days and so I thought I'll be a writer because I was always good in writing in school getting good marks in essays and all of that and I'll tell stories. I grew up in Calcutta and there were children on the streets and I would see how they lived and I wanted to tell the stories of children. And somewhere along the way I wanted a job, I got a job in the Telegraph newspaper, so I became a journalist instead. And then, uh, you know, I faced uh, many situations where I was personally attacked as a journalist, life-threatening. And uh, my testimonies about those life-threatening situations were gaslighted and trivialized and marginalized and invisibilized. It mustn't have happened to you. Where are your scratch marks? You know, you're doing this for publicity. Do you smoke cigarettes? The shame was all mine when I would try to speak about those things. And so I thought, uh, you know, I was angry, but I didn't know how to express it. In those t the days, I didn't have the vocabulary. But the anger was there. So by the time I ended up in the villages of Nepal and the brothels of Mumbai, it all poured out into this passionate documentary, which is possibly why I won the Emmy, because the truth and the passion came through. And, uh, you know, then from the Emmy, I just decided, went back to who I was, that, you know, I don't want to use my Emmy to build a career in journalism. I want to use my Emmy to make a difference. And that was the reason why I started Apne Aap. And as Rachna said, I, went, I asked the lady who gave me the award, and that time she was the U.S. Secretary of Health, Donna Shalela. I said, can you help me make a difference? As soon as I stepped off the stage. And she said, uh, what do you want? And I said, could you connect me to people in the UN? Could you connect me to the US congressmen and senators? And she took this 20-something girl seriously. And I was introduced to them. I went to the UN, showed my documentary, spoke to 160 ambassadors without flinching because I was speaking to a greater truth. And I said, we need a new UN convention or protocol which will punish the traffickers and decriminalize the women and girls. And we managed to get that passed. It's now called the UN Protocol to End Trafficking in Persons. You know about that. And uh, the other thing I did was did the same to the US Senate. Um, worked with two senators, Brownback and Wellstone, a Republican and a Democrat, showed the documentary there, testified, and played a role in the passage of the Trafficking Victim Protection Act. So, you know, girl by girl and law by law, I just began this relentless journey, and I developed a family of choice. Like, you know, really, um, she and I knew each other before we met each other. Yeah. This is the thing about the feminist the movement. Connection, yeah. yeah. And uh, that is true for many other people who are in the audience today. So, you know, that then taught me the vocabulary, the language, shared experiences. And my book, And I Kick and I Fly, is also about the power of women's collective action. And you will find it as you read it. Um, I've written it like an adventure story, but you will find how there's an adventure even in women coming together. There's something there. So, Ruchira, tell me, while working on this cause, I'm sure you would have stepped on several toes, you know, and a lot of people invested in uh, human trafficking for commercial reasons, you know, gaining profits from that. So, talk to us about the challenges you faced. And did you feel physically threatened at any point in time? Because you mentioned that in your book in one place. Yeah, so, you know, I was taking on criminals. And I wanted to go in without the help of the police or NGOs because I wanted to really talk to the women and ask them what they wanted. So at one point when I was filming, um, a man walked into this tiny room, which only had one door and the other thing was iron bars on the window. And he put a knife at my throat. And he said, I won't let you film here. And luckily for me, the 22 women who I was interviewing surrounded me. And they told the man that if you have to kill her, you've got to kill us first. And he realized it was too much trouble to kill 23 women and he slunk away. And that's why I again repeat that the power of women's collective action, the women who I thought were powerless rescued me even before I did anything with them. And I have found this again and again in my life. You know, our community centers are attacked, our staff is threatened, corrupt cops have even arrested my staff members sometimes, and we have to build a community worldwide to do online petitioning and all of that to get them out, right? 
and uh, we carry on but we organize at the grassroots and uh, the one of the things about apne aap is it's called self action but the other part of my ngo's name is women worldwide because we believe that self action can only be emboldened and succeed if we can build solidarity in small circles and there's no point looking up for help we have to look at each other so apne aap is based on forming mahila mandals in the grassroots where we organize in small groups of 10 and then the groups of 10 federate with each other and even went managed to play a role in the passage of the U Indian law against trafficking section 370 of the Indian penal code they went and testified to the varma commission i went to parliament with a survivor of trafficking to testify uh, did press conferences and you know that shame guilt and fear that survivors have to overcome to do that but you get confidence when there's somebody else next to you doing that and that is why i also wrote the book because the book is like a baton that i'm passing on to the next generation of activists that you know there is uh, an adventure in fighting for social justice and you can win but also very importantly for every kid and every young person or adult we have all faced body shaming you know somebody tells you you're too fat too thin too dark too white too masculine too feminine etc etc we have we lose our self esteem we all have faced body shaming and bullying connected to that sexual abuse maybe not sex trafficking like hira but through the character of hira we can have these conversations which there's a shroud of secrecy around and secrecy doesn't protect us it actually harms us so this book i hope will be used as a way to trigger conversation and spark change and also let people know that you are not alone you're not crazy the system is crazy and you can take on the system yeah thank you for that insight ruchira that was that was beautiful uh padas now my question is for you like i said before your book is of course a vivid and true account of your grandmother uh, mariam and it also intersects with the story of the horse breeder you mentioned luis feroz with whom uh, you know mariam rediscovers the world of the ancient horses caspian horses now your book reads like more like a racy bestseller and i don't mean that as a negative thing i mean it as a, a major compliment for you it's a fabulous book so uh, tell me how did you approach the narrative structure of this book the storytelling part of it you know to bring alive all these amazing figures thank you so much and thank you for the kind words you know it was it was challenging to figure out the best structure the narrative structure for the book because there were so many women whose stories i wanted to feature my grandmother mariam of course and louise firouz being two of them but also my aunts and also the many women who were the generals of the all female army um in afghanistan and the def the intergenerational strength that those women passed on to their daughters and i wanted so much to center so many of these women because this book it's really a history right when we talk about the war on terror and we talk about what happened in afghanistan it's almost always focused on the men and many of you've probably either read the book or seen the movie 12 strong it's a jerry bruckheimer film yeah. and it features the american men who went in and fought the taliban uh, in in 2001 yes, yes. but it's it's it was the book was actually called the american horse soldiers mm. but the women who trained those horses who fought alongside them they were eclipsed they were completely erased from yes, the narrative it's amazing completely erased and so i wanted their stories to shine through the page so what i ended up deciding to do was both going in chronological order but also then taking from the vantage point of these different women yeah. so i interspersed the stories we begin with my grandmother and then with louise yeah. and then my aunts come into the picture and then towards the end of the book it actually has me coming into the picture yeah. doing the same things that my grandmother that my aunt so all of us rode from iran into afghanistan We rode through gun battles. I rode into Afghanistan with a vial of horse sperm strapped to me, believe it or not, because we needed to continue breeding the horses. Yeah, and so 
I wanted to show how this intergenerational strength is passed on through the different women and through the different lineages as a way of recentering women's voices in history. Because as I said, when you look at the history of the war on terror, it's very much a masculine story. And yet, it was the women, and it also recenters local knowledge. Again, in the United States, when, you know, when there's panels and conferences about what do we do around, around terrorism or, or the Middle East, et cetera, it's almost always men. I can't tell you what a pleasure it is to sit on a stage with two powerful, strong women. Most of the time when I go to these events, if there's any woman at all, there's maybe one, I sit on panels with mostly men. And so I also wanted to recenter women, local women's knowledge as a way of bringing back and recentering the epistemological um, sanctity of traditional and, and local knowledges in the political battles of today. Right. So I'll just double click on this a little bit. Uh, you know, you've balanced historical accuracy here along with storytelling and crafting the story to make the book more accessible to everyone, not just historians maybe, not just sociologists, but everyone, the general reader. So uh, tell us how you manage this balance, you know? It's yeah. So this is actually quite a trick. I'm, I've been in academia for a long time. I'm in higher education. I'm now the president of a university. And people often ask me, like, why did you do that? Uh, and for me, I, I like to call myself an epistemological architect. I'm a knowledge architect. I'm obsessed with how we know what we know and what narratives we center. That's why you hear me saying you know, the need to center all of, all of this. I'm also quite aware that higher education can sometimes become a bubble and an echo chamber where we're only speaking to each other because our books are so overwritten and we use so much jargon. Um, I wrote a number of books on trafficking that are completely inaccessible. And I, and I realized that when I would go back to Dubai and back to Madagascar, where I would do my field work, and no one will have read the stories, the published works from which I wrote. And I read this great book called When They Read What We Write. And it occurred to me the absolute essential importance of having accessible knowledge of knowledge where the same people whose stories you are telling can be consumed by them and can change the world. Because at the end of the day, what good are our books and what good is, what good is knowledge and putting you know, a book like this together if it can't change the world that you're trying to change? And if it can't center the stories of the people whose narratives you want to bring out? So many of us write because we want to give a voice to the voiceless. So what good is it to write a book that the voiceless can't themselves read and promote and then can't use to bring about real, meaningful social change? Yes, that's right. So Pardis, can you share insights into your research process for uncovering all these stories about these warrior horsewomen? Because you're talking about how you went into Afghanistan, you know? And you talked to General Mina was her name, isn't it? So just talk to us about that a little bit, the challenges you face. Yeah. So, I mean, certainly I, I, I have to bow down to the woman sitting next to me because she is so, so incredibly brave and has faced so many challenges. I really, truly do mean that, Uchira. Um, and I really resonated with what you said about, you know, we get ourselves often into life-threatening situations. I myself have been in a number of those. And people often will say afterwards, where are your scars? Prove it. There's a, this burden of proof, especially as women writers and as women who tell stories, the burden of proof is so, so high. And people are always trying to take you down, right? And we have to keep up that fight. That's why we write the kinds of books that we, that we write. So for me, writing this book was also a little bit of a therapeutic process. But in terms of the research, um, it was, it's a combination. I'm an anthropologist by training. So it's a combination of oral narrative and oral history from my family. I interviewed my aunts and my grandmother. But I also went back and I interviewed many of these horsewomen warriors. 
Uh, and, and, you know, many of them had passed away, but, but again, trying to get the knowledge that had been passed down and then combining that with the knowledge that was in the horse world, right? That tacit knowledge. So going into horse archives, I never thought I would find myself in, you know, an international museum of the horse in the United Kingdom, but there I was and trying to trace the lineage of these horses because one of the characters we haven't talked about much today, we talk about these women, but the horses are also a main character in this book, right? And it's the, these horses that built the Persian Empire. And, and just a note on, you know, people say, why is your book called Book of Queens? Um, many of you who are in the audience, if you're Persian, you know about the Shahnameh, the epic book of kings, right? The most, most uh, read book uh, in, in most Iranian households. And for me, growing up, my parents would read Book of Kings all the time. And I remember thinking, but the female characters are the best ones. And there was one female horsewoman warrior named Gorda Farid, and she bested Rostam. Rostam was the great Persian, you know, warrior who was seen as the strongest warrior. And it was actually none of the men could fight him off. It was Gorda Farid who came riding out on her horse, and she bested Sohrab, and then she takes off her helmet, shakes her hair out, and he realizes she's a woman, and it's this like moment where he comes to his knees. And so I always thought that that epic should be called Book of Queens. So the research for this book dates back to the Persian Empire, the story of horses, and the story of horsewomen warriors, but then comes all the way forward into the de recently declassified uh, CIA files of the operation, Operation Alpha, um, wherein American horse soldiers were dropped into Afghanistan. So it spans thousands of years. Thus, it was no easy undertaking. And certainly, I will say, riding into a gun battle on horseback was probably the most um, both exhilarating and terrifying thing I've ever done in the name of research. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> so one concluding question for both of you, Pardes and Ruchira. What does it mean to you to be a woman of strength and resilience? Clearly, it's not a walk in the park. You've already talked about it. Ruchira has talked about how the pimp took a knife to her throat. And we've just talked about how you braved a lot of geographical features and the warlords and entered Afghanistan. So uh, tell us a little about what it means to be a woman of substance. Mm -hmm. Ruchira? Can I just read a little bit from the book, yes, uh, which yes, will course, show you what, where somehow the impulse comes, and where does it come from? It's hard to say, but there are moments of encounters which give you the strength to do something. So in this book, it's about this 14-year-old girl called Hira, and she's from a nomadic tribe, about to be sold into the sex trade when the cattle fair comes to town. She's expelled from school for kicking the teeth of a class bully, who notices her stealing an egg, and. to Rini these program, this woman's rights advocate. So it's a conversation between Hira and Miradi, and it's her impulse that why does she decide to fight on? What if everyone in Girls' Bazaar, Chacha and Baba are right? Did Chotu die because of me? What if I did bring bad luck to the family? I voice my doubts aloud. This grabs Miradi's attention. Since when did you begin to believe in the superstitious nonsense? I don't meet Miradi's eye, focusing instead on Jamila Bua as she fries the onion pakoras for the lunchtime rush. A black crow drives a sparrow away from the garbage. It's a stark reminder that the mightiest will survive, that destiny decides who will be mighty. It's the way of the world, Miradi. If destiny hasn't decided where I was born, who has? It's all a birth lottery, I say bitterly, walking up and down inside the small space of our shack. Miradi comes and hugs me. She strokes my head. I know you feel frustrated, but do you have a choice? 
what else can you do but go back to sleep, uh, to school? I steer the conversation away from destiny. In my heart, I know that I don't believe the superstitions. All the women in our lane do believe in the eternal, inescapable fate of our nomadic tribe because they can't imagine anything beyond it. There was no defiant mother or cousin or sister or teacher to fight for them. I decide to spell out my other fear. What if I don't understand anything in class? There, I've said it. I don't want to be the stupidest kid in the class anymore, especially Sharad Chandra, Mahadevi Varma, Mahashweta Devi, and the adventure stories by the English writers Enid Blyton and Laura Lee Hope. Words had always come easily to me. Then came the hunger, the bullying, the chores at home, my first menstruation. Everything slipped away. Oh, that was because you and Salman Da would help me when I got stuck. Then ask Salman to help you. Oh, he's so busy with his studies, I mutter. Can't you help me? Do you think I remember anything after the hell I've lived through these past few years? There's an aggressive edge to her voice. I see a small, worn spark of hope fight the fear in her eyes. She wants to convince me to go to school against all the odds I must face. Under her clumsy makeup is a desperate appeal. Outside, the sky is gray, the sun sending out weak rays through the mist. Far off, a train whistle blows. I give Miradi's hand a squeeze. I promise I will go meet Rini Di. I want to anyway. That's beautiful. I just, yeah, want that's to, I just have to say one last bit, okay, that's sure. all. Miradi gets up, stiffens, drawing in her shoulders as she walks away. Selfishly, perhaps, I realize that I'm not doing this just for her. I want to be a person. I want to kick and fly. I want to win. I want to have the courage like Rini Di to demand a life without fear. Bake off zindagi. Beautiful. I want to kick and fly. <laughs> that should be the slogan. Pardis, what about you? Um, so I'll be honest with you. I have a complicated relationship to the word resilience. Because whenever people say, well, you've got to be more resilient, you've got to be more resilient. There are times when I think, why is it that we still live in a world where we have to be so resilient? Why can't we change the the conditions of the world? Why can't we change the circumstances so that we don't have to constantly be so resilient? So for me, I really think a lot about strength and that's why I talk about intergenerational strength. And so I see it as my role to pass on to my daughter and the generations, my students and, 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 and all the generations to come, to pass on that intergenerational strength so that they can continue to work towards building a world where the burden of resilience doesn't have to always be carried so heavily by the already frail shoulders of so many women and girls around the world. Yes, absolutely. So thank you, Ruchira and Padis, for such an enlightening conversation. I'm sure a lot of us are going to be like really inspired by the tales of women astride their Caspian horses and the story of Hira, who wins despite odds. On this interesting note, let's conclude the conversation for the day. Ladies and gentlemen in the audience, it is your turn now. We are open for questions. Very interesting session. So uh, my question is for both these ladies who have so graciously enlightened our morning. Uh, you have uh, written your novels with an aim of bringing the stories of the voiceless or the stories that had been eclipsed all over these years. So did, uh, were there any instances in your life where a reader came up to you and provided a fresh perspective of your text, a perspective which you had never thought of including, yet the reader perceived it that way? Um, I, I can start with that. Definitely. Uh, in, you know, um, my very first book, 
I, I wrote the book with, with the intentions of ex exactly bringing a voice to the voiceless and, and really being a part of the feminist movement. And then I, 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 I had several readers say, well, you know, um, your work could be taken a completely different way. It could be seen as playing into that narrative of brown women needing to be saved from brown men, right? That, those rescue narratives. And it really, it really flipped the script for me. And, and it sort of led me into diving more deeply into pos positionality and reflexivity and asking myself about my relationship to, to the written word. And so, you know, with, with, with this book, by the time, you know, seven books later, um, I see it so much, my writing process, I see it so much more as a conversation. And every piece that I write, I try to be in conversation with the words, but also in conversation with the people whose stories that I'm writing so that we can start to tease apart positionality and reflexivity. Yeah, I agree with what uh, she said. So I think we'll, uh, there is one question that a reader did ask me, that what happened to uh, the shoes that Hira had worn, which uh, she was teased for because they were torn? And also about other characters, what's their backstory? Yes, ma'am. Question from you. Yes, um, I worked in the late 90s with the UN on trafficking in the South Asia region. And there was a wonderful network of NGOs in different countries in the region. So I kind of have two questions. Um, ha has the situation improved? Are we still fighting the, the same battles we were in the 90s? And then the second part relates to what um, Patis just said. Why is it the women who have to keep being resilient? We talked a lot about a gap being the demand side for trafficking. What work has been done with the men? What can be done? So yes, there has been uh, a lot of uh, progress in the struggle that we have against uh, sex trafficking. Uh, South Asia continues to be the epicenter for South, uh, sex trafficking in the world with the largest numbers of uh, victims in this region, but that's also because we have such a large population, so percentage-wise. No country is uh, immune from the traffickers because there are enough girls who can be preyed upon in every country, including America or India or Europe, because intersectionality exists everywhere. So there's a last girl everywhere who's poor, female, a teenager. On top of that, in India or Nepal or Bangladesh, she's uh, probably from an oppressed caste or religion. And in America, she could be Native American or black and in Europe, a refugee. So she, her intersecting inequalities cut her off from her basic needs, which the traffickers prey upon. Uh, on the other hand, uh, when I began working on this, we didn't have laws, we didn't have protocols, we didn't have an understanding of the face of the victim. Now there's a huge survivor movement across the world where women are coming forward and saying what happened to them, why they were trafficked, who seduced them, tricked them, lured them. And exactly as uh, we spoke about today, that choice became irrelevant. You know, there was no burden of proof that if you said yes, it was a survival strategy. So that understanding has come. And now we don't say prostitute, you know, we say victim of sex trafficking. I say the word prostituted woman or prostituted child to remind people that there is an absence of choice in the whole process. We also have a fantastic legal framework now in South Asia and all the countries. Globally, uh, the UN protocol to end trafficking, which takes away the blame from the victim and shifts it to the perpetrator. So yes, there is progress, not enough, because the traffickers have huge amounts of money at their disposal from the sex industry. And uh, they are one step ahead of us. Now they've begun to use AI to uh, not just groom and season uh, male perpetrators to buy girls from the age of 12 onwards, but also to um, you know, surf the net to find girls who are boys who say, I'm angry, I'm unhappy, I want to commit suicide. And they go through an army of fake chartboards targeting such kids and grooming and seasoning them. So we have a lot going on right now. And then, of course, you know about the whole trial of Zuckerberg and Facebook and Instagram and how they are body shaming kids and what that is doing. So we have challenges in this new world order that we have to take on. Uh, on the demand side, we have at least managed to get laws in a lot of country to address the demand for human trafficking. 
because human trafficking is a demand driven industry it's not like a girl who's 10 says i'm going to grow up to be a prostitute she is preyed upon because she is vulnerable and that is because there's a man who wants to buy a 9 year old or a 12 year old and then these criminals and traffickers think there's profit to be made on it so to disrupt the trafficking industry we have to go after the demand and many laws now do that which we now call this cluster of laws across the world the nordic model or the equality model the mic there please the mic hi thank you for the enlightening talk um, my question is around understanding what do you think about creativity and the relationship between re resilience so specifically also from the indian context like you talked about her hira story she uh, when we go into an educational system we know we want to bre break it but then creativity stops so academia is talking about it but the reality sometimes at least i can say i work with young girls and is very very different so what are your views on that yeah i mean I, that's a great question i'll say that you know i think is a central component. I, I think, you know, I remember when the pandemic had, had just hit and everything was sort of turbulent and I went um, to a talk and someone just said, the world is upside down, just go make art. Go make beautiful things and you'll start to find your strength back. So for me, the whole process of this book actually was about finding my strength through creativity. This is the f first complete creative book that I, I've allowed myself to sort of go bridge out of just academia. And it, it really did make me feel like myself again. You know, Hyphen was my crossover book. This is my first full foray into creativity. And so I will say that one of the most interesting things for me in academia has been this wave globally to bring interdisciplinarity to the Is to knowledge from around the world. That to me is the most exciting change that we're seeing in academia today. Oh,